TLO, what's poppin'? We are on Twitch. We are not live. But you can leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells. Now let's continue to go to family from Chicago to the UK and all around the world, apparently, because this one's from Sydney, Australia. We ain't even got to it yet, man. But if we do go live, if you happen to miss any of the highlights, we'll be on this page. Uh, don't forget, we do got the Patreon as well. Get a double upload today. And we do got the Discord, too, where you can drop your request. Um, yeah, but this is the Taboo Room. Man, they've been dropping some heat. I ain't even gonna lie. Salute to the Taboo Room, man. When, when In a world full of nothing, you gave us something <laughs> to react to. I appreciate it, man. I don't know what's going on. But this dude is from Sydney, Australia. His name is... Join his his first name is Join. He was already destined to join a gang. That's tough. Uh, gangs, prison, and murder inside the world of a life of a career criminal. Okay. And uh, in the practice, uh, so I thought I'll t since primary school go back. And, um, Did we start already? Sydney City. Age. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so we start. So and I um, always had a nice fascination with oh. Spanian is the infamous career criminal from Australia, has a long history of illegal activities. His elusive and cloning nature has earned him a notorious reputation in the country's criminal underworld with multiple arrests and con convictions to his name. Spanian's criminal career has left a trail of victims and continues to be subject of interest and intrigue. In Australia, everywhere I want went in Australia, I was asked if I could capture experience. Oh, okay. Knives, and um, I was well versed in the practice of knives since primary school. Um, I was well versed in the practice of uh, practice of knives. It's a crazy statement. So I thought I'll take this as an opportunity to go back to the school and um, do a siege. So the very first time I got arrested was actually a fun one. I went back to my high school and I uh, took a kitchen knife and um, I held the school siege and I made national news, I was in the national newspaper. <laughs> what do you mean he held I was raised here in Sydney City, the inner city areas, housing areas, most all the flats, housing commission houses. Um, my childhood was, at a young age, it was good, I had a good childhood. Um, what about your education? My education? <laughs> Let's put it this way. Um, most of the schoolwork I've done was in boys' homes, juvenile detention. To put it in a perspective, the level of my education, although I'm an exceptionally intelligent person, considering my circumstances, but yeah, um, most of the school I've done was in boys' homes in jail, yeah. And it was fun. <laughs> why did that happen? Why, why was you in boys' homes and jails? Oh, well. Depends how, how Jordan Peterson you want me to get with this, all right? Nah, but um, at the end of the day, like, I, I, I'm from the inner city area of Sydney and um, crime and drug addiction is all part of the culture here, or very much was. Uh, members of my family were famous criminals and good thieves, stuff like that, drugs in my family. So it was inevitable for me to follow that path. So as early as I could, you know, the age when you're out and about and you're allowed to hit the streets and everyone gets their character. You know, some kids about, become skateboarders and... About, about, about 11, 9, 10, 11. Okay, that's Chicago. Maybe like 11, 12, 13 for y'all. It's probably nine, to be realistic. I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna say nine. Some kids become footy players and some kids become career criminals. And that's, that's what I chose. So I ended up in boys' homes and... Um, yeah, pretty much raised in boys' homes, yeah, but. What was the first thing you was ever arrested for? What was the first crime you committed? <sighs> the first crime I committed, the first thing I was arrested for are two very different things, but we'll talk facts, about the- Facts, facts. Because the first time you got arrested was the first time you got caught for committing crime. I get you. The first thing I was arrested for, um, it was while I was still going, so obviously it's the first thing I was arrested for, so I hadn't been to boys' homes yet. Um, I was still going to high school. I think I was in year eight. 14 years old, and I was um, stealing, stealing mobile phones. 
you know, mobile phones come, we're talking the year 2000 here. So when mobile phones just come out, or the Nokia's, you know, playing Snake, so I used to go around stealing kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When all you had to do was just sell a phone, like now you can't even take a phone and do nothing with it. It's, you take somebody's phone, it's, it's pointless. It's a paperweight. Back then you could do something. It's phones and whatever. And uh, apparently, some um, someone gave me out for stealing their mobile phone, so I got suspended from school. And I um, always had a nice fascination with knives, and um, I was well versed in the practice of knives <laughs> since primary school. Um, Sorry. So I thought I'll take this as an opportunity to go back to the school and um, do a siege. So the very first time I got arrested was actually a fun. Oh, a siege. Okay. One. I went back to my high school and I uh, took a kitchen knife and um, I held the school siege and I made national news, I was in the national newspaper. <laughs> Daniel, yeah. Tell me about that story from the start. You wanna hear that story in depth? Of All right. course. Um, of course, Spain, Spanian? Why would we not wanna hear that? <laughs> so, like I said, the, the, the first part's already been said. Someone gave me up, I got suspended, don't come back to school. The next day I went to the school, right? Got a kitchen knife. And I thought I'd blend in. What, what my plan was, was to find, go door to door, classroom to classroom with my kitchen knife and sort of intimidate someone into admitting that they gave me up. I wanted to know who gave me up. So, you know, I can, I don't know what I was gonna do to be honest, like I'll be straight out with you. I didn't go there with the intention to kill everyone. I'm not, you know, I'm not Charles Manson, but you know, like I want, I just wanted to make a statement, you know? And I was at that age, 14 years old, you know? And then, so I went there, class went. Man, I'm not even gonna lie, but the way the world is now, you can never do this. You can never do this and walk out. I don't know, like, and I, I went with my class like I wasn't suspended, right? And I presumed that I'd be able to blend in for a bit before they clicked on. But anyway, class went in and <clears throat> my very first class, I walked in the door, teacher turned straight to me and said, my real name's Anthony, right? You all know me as, Sp well, you don't know me, he's learning me as Spanian, but yeah, my real name's Anthony. So teacher turned straight to me and said, Anthony, you're not supposed to be here, go home. <laughs> And I thought, fuck, bro, I'm done already, you know what I mean? I'm already busted, it hasn't been one second. So I pulled my knife out and I let it commence from there. So I pulled out this big kitchen knife and um, I turned to the class and I said, nah, 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 listen, which fucking dog gave me up? Like who gave me up for stealing their phone? Oh, and it's some threats, I'll kill you, your motherfuckers, this and that, whatever. And everyone was just like, oh, like, nah, nah, like, oh, we don't know. <clears throat> and then I thought, so no one's like, it, it, no one in that class admitted it. So I, I went, I, I thought in my head, I'll go door to door and do this, you know, like along the classrooms, along the hallway. So I went to the next classroom, burst. How big was the school? Like, what, did you have like a, a, three, a three room class or something? After that first class, it was probably over with. They was on your butt, it was on you. To the door, same thing, same spill. Who gave me up? I'll fucking kill you, blah, blah, blah. I made it to about the, Fourth class, fifth class. <laughs> Mind you, at the third, <laughs> is, <laughs> I, I was improvising, right? I was doing psycho improvising. So when we got to the, when I got to the third door, the doors were unlocked. Like I could just open them. But for dramatic effect, I was booting, <laughs> I was booting it open, you know? So it's like a movie scene. And um, <laughs> I was booting that door, wood flying everywhere. And I'm like, ah, I'll kill you all, this and that. But when I got to the fifth classroom, there was a little bit of a struggle. And um, principal or whoever it was, must have got word. So they put an alarm over the system, whatever, like evacuation call. And I just remember hearing on the, on the uh, radio, like everyone to their- So basically you was one of the first school, basically, you was one of the first school threats. Assembly area, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Mind you, this was like 23 years ago. So forgive me if I don't know every single word. <clears throat> so everyone started running. All the classrooms are clearing. And I thought, well, <laughs> this is getting a bit further than I thought. So I thought I'll try to blend in. You know, I was going to leave it there. <laughs> I said, I thought I'd try to blend in. Hey, this is not funny. Okay. There. And um, I put my knife away and I had my school uniform on. So I thought I'll try to blend in with everyone. So I joined the evacuation and I'm evacuated. <laughs> and I remember kids saying like, 
what's going on? I'm like, is this a drill? <laughs> and I was answering them. I was going, yeah, I don't know. It might be a fire or something, you know? He the type to steal your wallet and help you look for it. That's tough. Anyway, so we got down the stairs and when we got to the assembly area in between all of the big buildings, there was like 300 students there. Run. And um, I come down the stairs trying to blend in and the prin or vice principal, whoever had the megaphone, I honestly don't remember, called me out straight away. Anthony, just just go home like that. <laughs> and bro, like, I'm telling you, lad, like, I was gonna leave it at that. They bring this on themselves. So I'm standing there and then 300 kids look at me from my year to year 12 kids, you know? And I thought, fuck, like, I gotta go with this. So it was, it was the funniest scene, but I was like, brave I was in front of everyone. I pulled out the knife again and I'm like, <laughs> That's it, I'll kill you all. <laughs> and the whole class scattered, all right? This is where it started to get out of control. So I didn't plan for this. The whole class, no, the whole school scatters and they're hitting the streets. Like I'm talking kids are running in the streets. Like teachers are getting the kids, like just leave the school premises. So I'm chasing them and just like, I don't want to stab anyone, you know what I mean? It's, it's not that serious. So I'm just trying to scare people like- It's not that serious. I mean, as a kid, you probably think like, man, I'm not trying to hurt nobody, but you already done took it to level 97. You got four gold police stars in GTA. It's up. It's serious for everybody else. Swinging near their face. And if I'm catching them while they're running, I'm like kicking them in the back and stuff. And I got to the main road and um, and all the students had ran this way, the majority of them, they'd run to the main road and I ran out and I was just gonna chase them down the streets and that. And I noticed that the teachers were at every residence doors, like down the street, and they were like banging. Like, I'm, like it's more serious than I thought, you know? And they were banging and they're saying, let us in, let us in, there's like a murderer. <laughs> and so like there's residents opening their doors and like piling packs of 30 kids in each house. And then at that point I thought, look, this has gone too far. I better just like hook it, you know, I was gonna step. So I ran down the back of the oval. On my way there, there was coincidentally, um, my, a, a class of my um, year, year eight students playing softball down the back. So they had like sports. So they weren't part of this whole fiasco, you know? And I seen them chase them off, chase them over the fence and. Oh, that's literally just, just told us. He thought it was going too far. He seen more students and then continued to chase. One of the teachers or whoever, at some point during this, had gone and round up a whole bunch of public heroes, construction workers and all these idiots. And they come chase me with a shovel and obviously bash me. I'm a 14 year old kid. Even though I got a knife, there's like that many grown men with shovels. So I got smashed with a shovel, held on the floor, News came, <laughs> there was like this news, Channel 7 news, Channel 10 news, and then all police, and that was my first ever arrest, by the way, yeah. It was very dramatic. I mean, hey, listen. At that point, where do you go from there? You already have to, that's the, that's one of the, the okay, I, I'm a word that's funny, okay? That's one of the craziest first arrest story I ever heard in my life. You normally hear, yeah, I got arrested for shoplifting at first, and then from there it was just an ascending. No, you started here. You started at the top of the arrest chain. It, your arrest don't get no, I ain't, it don't get no crazier. Manic. And so, first, first ever arrest, and obviously, obviously, you know, if it's your first time arrested, they let you off. They weren't letting me off that one. So I ended up in boys' homes. I spent four weeks in boys' homes for that and they let me out on some type of, um, they evaluated me to be mentally unstable, so. I can, I can, you probably are reformed, you're a better person, but I can clock it. The way you telling this story, it's too much passion and, and you like reliving it, you happy still. At that point, they'd given me some order of counseling in the community, so I got out after four weeks, and that was my first ever experience, brother. And then what was next, man? What was next? <clears throat> so after that, I think more, I was just getting arrested. So we're talking 14, from, if you're talking my juvenile times, 14 to 18, I spent most of that inside. I think one time in my boredom inside a cell, I'd calculated the amount of time I stayed out and this and that thing. During my juvenile period, I was out for about eight months over that four year period. It was, 
I can't tell you exactly each time what it was because there was multiple, you know what I mean? I was in and out, three months in, one week out, six months in, two days out, stuff like that. But um, at that point in, in time, we were doing ram raids, we're stealing shit boxes with screwdrivers, smashing them through shops, smashing them through offices, loading it up with computers and stuff like that. During my juvenile period, got done for a lot of, um, yeah, ram raids, break and enters, uh, yeah, stuff like that. Well, I feel like growing up in a, in a in a city like like the only normal thing that I heard was breaking and entering. What was the like? juvenile centres like in this country? Because in, in London or the UK, should I say that they're considered to be, I guess, even worse than the prisons. Just due to everyone's got a point to prove at that age. Hmm. Is it the same here or? Yeah, I. That's that's you, you're the first person that's ever really asked it that way after all of these podcasts that I've done, brother. That's a good question. I'll tell you what I find about juvenile compared to the adult system in Australia. It's it's a lot more aggressive on a lower level. So there's a lot more lower end aggression in in juvenile. Everyone's want everyone to fight over anything because the consequences in juvie are, less. are very small. So yeah. you have a fight. You go to yourself for the night, right? So people, they, they, we're fighting over everything. You know what I mean? There's punch-ons, four or five punch-ons a day because there's no consequences. So you only got to get called a gronk here. And like, there was an old thing like, if you call someone a gronk, they got, that, that's, it's on, you know what I mean? Gronk. I'm just curious, where do you record these at, Taboo? Because I can hear people in the background. You need to tell them, hey, listen, quiet on set. <laughs> Good deal. Here in Australia means like. I also got these super sensitive studio headphones. They can hear anything, so maybe not to the. Maybe if I had these on, I wouldn't be able to hear them. But how would you like? I'm trying to think how 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 how, how would they say bro, Gronk in England, bro? <laughs> Whatever, bro. The gron anyway, the point of the story is Gronk is a diss word. So you chuck that out there, the fight's on, people punching on all the time. You go to your cell for the night, you come back out, everyone's friends. In jail, there's big consequences to fights. Like, you have a fight, you're gone to Segro, you lose all of your property, you're sitting in there for a month, you've got no food, you've got no TV. So people hold back on the fights a lot. So there's way less fights. But when there is fights, they're a lot more serious. So you you, you got to contemplate that. Like, if I'm gonna go, if I'm gonna I'm gonna smash, I'm gonna go to Segro for how long? I'm gonna get any good. So in juvie, people aren't getting stabbed, people aren't getting this and that. Everyone's just you know it's, it's like yeah, box is like sparring in there, right? You know what I mean? It's part of training. And then what was next in Spain? So after doing four years in the juvenile system. Yeah, I done about three and a half of those four years in the juvenile system, and then um, graduated to prison. Um, so when I was about 16, 17, uh, I become a heroin addict. Um, yeah. Started injecting heroin. Yeah. 16, 17, you went from that to that. I'm glad you changed. I can already know you changed your life around because. Heroin, which was all part of our culture around here in Sydney City. <clears throat> uh, heroin addiction, thieving, stuff like that. And um, so my crimes, had changed accordingly. So I was doing a lot more junky type crimes, low level crimes. Spaniard. That's massive. How did that happen? How did I? Yeah, yeah, we're not just gonna. Good, hey, good thing, Tab. Don't let him scroll past that. <laughs> that is massive. Right? Become a heroin addict. Um, funny, this is, this is, as funny as this may sound, when you're growing up around these inner city flats around here, heroin was. You know how you hear people say, oh, when we went to school, you smoke, all the cool kids smoke cigarettes and you sneak down and you smoke your cigarettes behind your canteen and blah, 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 all those yarns. That was heroin to us. In where I grew up in the, in the decade that I was a kid around here. So you're telling me when you grew up as a kid in high school, all the cool kids was doing dog. They was doing H. Hey, yeah, we about to ditch school and go do some H. I'm in. It's crazy. Yeah, early 2000s. 
It's like if you weren't on the heroin, you weren't one of the boys. As funny as that sounds. Look at you, I don't want to be one of the boys. That does not sound funny, man, Anthony. That sounds crazy to me coming from Chicago because that is like total opposite. But that's that's the truth. All the other, all the older boys that we looked up to, the bank robbers, the ram raiders, the searchers, they were all heroin addicts. Our peers were heroin addicts. It was like becoming one of the boys. It was almost to the extent that when we were all heroin addicts, we looked at people that weren't on the heroin as gronks. It's like, hey, you're not even one of the boys. Like, you're not even on the gear. You're not even uzzling. You're not even shooting up. In hindsight, that sounds ridiculous. And I know that's not the case for a lot of the world, but here it was. So That sounds absolutely insane to me. Well, so you're not even one of the guys. You're not, you're not putting that belt around your arm, grabbing it with your teeth, putting tension on it, slapping your vein. Like, you're not one of the guys. That's, that's how that just sounded to me. That's crazy. <laughs> There is no tragic circumstances in which I become a heroin addict. I'm not trying to hide any pain or anything like that. It was like, almost like, fuck, I can't wait to be a heroin addict. Yeah, bro, where's the heroin? Let's show one of the boys now. Let's go, oh, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, that's, it was just all part of the culture here. That's crazy. Mm, and um, lucky for me, and barely any of the boys that I grew up with in these circumstances, I... I this is like the second dude from Australia that is just like outrageously wild. Like Mark Chopper Reed <laughs> and then this dude is like, yo, what's really going on here? I ended up getting off when I was 21 in prison. Um, but a lot of the most and most, all of the boys haven't and their lives have suffered accordingly. Their life is in jail, 15, 20% of them are dead. Yeah. How, how did you get off the heroin? Was it? I know you said you was in jail. <coughs> From yeah. my where is probably the most addictive substance on the planet. Mm -hmm. How did I get off off um, the heroin? One day, bro, like in the midst of my junkiness, whatever you want to call it, I'm down at a prison out in the country doing an 18 month sentence, whatever, <sighs> far from home, junked off my head, and. And to that extent, I never had a perspective of me being a junkie. In my head, I was Spanian from Sydney City, the mad money maker, the good looking cunt. You know what I mean? Like, I was fresh, I was violent. I was the man in my head, right? Because being a heroin addict was so normal that it didn't come into, it didn't come into play. One day, but don't ask me what, right? One day. I walked in my cell, it was locked in, it was like 10, 11 o'clock at night, by myself in a cell, little shaving mirror that we got in our cell. Looked in it a million times, brother. I walked past there and I looked in the mirror, and this sounds corny, but this is the fucking truth. I walked in it in that one split second, this is why I say, I don't know if it was a psychosis or divine intervention. I seen the true me. I looked in that mirror and I seen a full, ugly, putrid, junkie, loser. Like that. I seen it. I, saw, I looked and I was like, I'm not going to argue with you. <laughs> hey, that's what you've seen and that's what it was. I'm glad you've seen it early. I shit myself. I was like, what the fuck? I spent in that night two or three hours staring at myself and I didn't know what the fuck was going on. In, in two hours, my whole perspective of myself had changed and I was embarrassed of myself. I was embarrassed of the way I looked. I was embarrassed of what I had become. Even my perspective of the boys in the wing with me. So in the wing, when we get released, I thought, yeah, I'm in the prison wing, you know, we're all this and that. <clears throat> I thought everyone was mad there. I thought prison was the collection of all the sick <laughs> in Sydney, you know what I mean? If you're in prison, you're a mad <laughs> And I walked out even the next day, skipping forward to the next day, I walked out and every lad that I looked at, my mates, the randoms, I just looked at as a pack of future junkies. Like, I don't know what happened to me in that hour, but it changed my whole perspective. I'm not saying it changed my perspective of crime. If anything, it led to me being a better criminal, but it changed my perspective on myself. And that night, listen here carefully, I was addicted to buprenorphine, which is the substitute for heroin addiction. It's like methadone, the tablet version. 
heroin, injecting, injecting since I was a teenager, right? And that's the hardest thing to beat, needles. People think the certain drug is the hardest thing to overcome, but the feeling of putting that steel in your arm and injecting it, and whatever substance it may be, hitting you instantly is a very addictive thing. In fact, I might say it's more addictive than the substances themselves. I gave that up. Cigarettes. The science of it all makes sense of what he said. The instant gratification over the uh, the weight. I can see what he's talking about. I've never partaken, but. I was smoking, back then we had pouches, white ox, you know, smoking 100, 150 cigarettes a week, whatever. All on that same night, I said to myself, in that two hours of looking in the mirror, I said to myself, I promised myself that I'm gonna be the, a better criminal, I'm gonna be fit, I'm gonna be sexy, I'm gonna be a mad money maker. All of this money that I'm out here making, I prided myself as some mad money maker. Oh yeah, I'd steal your laptop, I'd break it, do a ram raid and feel good. And I give all the money away to drug dealers. I was a bum. And I promise to never be a bum again. I promise to never be ugly again. I promise to never be a shit fighter again. So I come out the next day and I gave all of my stuff away. We had syringes. I had syringes hidden in the kettle, drugs in my mattress, whatever I had. I gave, I said to the boys, I go take everything out of my cell. They got excited. They thought it was Christmas. So they flew in, ripped my cell to shreds. Um, and I, they thought I was spinning out and I, I might've been spinning out. And they looked at me like, even a couple of them that actually had care for me said like, bro, don't give all your stuff away, bro. Like, are you spinning out? Like, you're gonna be sick, you're gonna be hanging out. I said, brother, take it. Don't ever say that to me again. And from that- that's, Hey, that's, hey, look, I salute it. I salute it. Cause you hardcore enough to get on there. You hardcore enough to be in jail. You hardcore enough to quit cold turkey then if that's what you're gonna do. Day, that was in September 2007. I was 21 years old and hey. I have been off drugs, cigarettes, no alcohol, no nothing now for since 2007. What's that? 15? I don't know, 16 years. 16 years, brother. <laughs> I hung out. Like, obviously, I withdrew. Hanging out, we call it. I withdrew very strongly uh, for a week and a half. No sleeping, couldn't stand up. And I loved every moment of it. I loved every moment of it. People, uh, people, and people ask me nowadays, because I had this goal. I'm gonna be the drug dealer. I'm gonna be the one taking your money. I'm hey, no cap, I like this dude. I like this dude. I, can't, I don't know what it is, but I like him. I'm gonna be the one fucking your girl. I'm gonna hey, be the oh, one oh. doing this, dude. That's gonna be me. That's not gonna be other people anymore. I'm not letting that happen to me. I'm gonna be the goat of the hood, you know what I mean? I'm the hood superstar. And that's been, that was my intention for a long time. <clears throat> And people say to me because, like I said, to a lot of people, it's a big dramatic thing. Wow, you were injecting heroin since you were 16, 17. Like, wow, how did you get off it? Um, and they ask me until today, do you get cravings? Do you get cravings? Like, do you ever, do you see heroin? And it's like, oh, and a crumble. And I'm like, listen, let me tell you one perfect way of saying it, all right? <clears throat> if you've been eating something, right? I've said this before. If you've been eating shit, for 10, 5, 20, 30 years. I don't care how long you've been eating shit. You thought it was bubble gum. Looks like bubble gum, tastes like bubble gum. You put it in your mouth and it chews like bubble gum. And I come to you one day, just like what happened to me in a cell, and I knock the dust off that bubble gum and I show you that shit. Look, you thought it was bubble gum. What are you gonna do? Oh, you're gonna wow. say this, you're gonna go, oh, yuck, 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 and you're gonna go wash your hands. Yeah. You just noticed it's shit. Then I say to you, do you crave that anymore? Because you've done it for 25 years. What are you going to say? Of course I don't fucking crave it. It's shit. It don't matter how long I've done it. So that's what happened, brother. And that's how I can be here 15, 16 years later. And I ain't going to lie. He played at that picture beautifully. <laughs> it ain't a thing. You know what I mean? On the back of that, then, Spanning, if you could go back in time, would you have never touched heroin? <sighs> If I could go back in time, would I have never have touched heroin? I don't regret touching heroin. I don't regret it. Because I'll tell you one thing, bro, when you go back in time and not do things, at the end of the day, I'm here right now, and my life's sweet. What if I didn't touch heroin? If I didn't touch heroin, this is, and I'm putting this in perspective. I get it, it's a part of your legacy. It's a part of, it what made you 
has made you who you are today. It was a vital step in your me mental, which eventually helped you. This is real, right? At the end of the day, I'm here and I love who I am and I love what I've done. If I didn't touch heroin when I was 16, maybe I would have been playing footy and crossed the road and got killed. How can you say, you know what I mean? Like the life choices that you make are your path. I could have been anything in the world, including dead. So I'm happy that I'm here and I have two healthy children and I have a good life and I'm alive. So how can I take anything away? Anything of your past you take away or switch, you're probably gonna end up dead, you know what I mean? And then what was next for you, Spaniel? After that, after me getting off heroin. So when I got off heroin, um, that didn't change the criminality in me at that point in my life. So I was 21 years old. If anything, I emphasized the criminality after that. Like I told you, I wanted to be a better criminal. So my goals had gone from being the lad in the hood that stabs everyone and makes the money, but he's on, on the drugs. I wanted to be the smart. I wanted to be the smart cunt. I wanted to be the cunt with the cars, the jewelry, this and that. And that was my goal. And I, I set out on a mission and I couldn't wait to get out of prison. Thought about it every day. Every time I was in prison, when I get out, I'm gonna kill it, I'm gonna kill it, I'm gonna kill it. And um, stop the violence, because <clears throat> the violence is, out of all the types of crime, and this is what I say to people, people will like to see me now because of what I do and I tell my prison stories. And my story is like a story of redemption in a way. They confuse me with like, you know, like I'm someone out to save the kids. They confuse me a lot with that, but I just tell it how it is. And what I say to kids is, I'm not gonna tell you kids to not be a criminal. I'm not a policeman and I never will be and I'll never tell someone not to be a criminal, but I will tell you one thing from my lessons. Don't do violence and rubbish crime. Go make money. Do something that's worth it. Imagine being a dickhead that sits in jail for 25 years for stabbing someone. What a fucking loser, cuz. You <laughs> he's spitting facts. Low key. It sounds crazy what he said, but he's spitting facts. Like, dang, bro, you, you locked up for what? You said you locked up for what? All that money out there, you locked up for what? Didn't even make money, he didn't even have a mad life. You know how many idiots are sitting in jail? Pretty much, let's put it like this, what are you in jail for? Oh, because this lad thought he was tough. Hey, and what happened? I was tougher than him. Oh, so what happened? Oh, and I got 25 years for being tougher than him. Good on you, mate. See you later, brother. What a loser. At least if there's, at least if you're in jail, you're in jail, what did you do? Oh, bro, I was killing it outside. I had this car, all these women everywhere. I swear, I got money, I'll get out to it. So that's my only, the, the, the only thing that I say. And the reason I say that at this point uh, in this yarn is because that was my intention after that. So I only just turned really money focused with my crime and um, <clears throat> still end up in and out of jail for it. Uh, end up being a drug dealer, fairly successful drug dealer, selling heroin and cocaine. Um, done exactly what I wanted to do, switched the circumstances and done it to the best of my ability and was good at it. Still got arrested though, wasn't that good, eh? <laughs> but anyway, that didn't bother me cuz because I felt like I belonged in jail. Um, so going back to jail was nothing at that point in time. The times have changed now, I don't feel that way anymore. But um, yeah. That's what happened directly after that. I got out and become a worse criminal and done bigger sentences. So then my sentences started jumping from 18 months, a year here to like four years, six years. So the last sentence was like six years. And so in fact, sometimes like your way of thinking, oh, it's better to be a shit criminal. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Spaniel, can you tell me what was your worst memory of being in prison? <sighs> worst memory of being in prison? If you're thinking of it in some dramatic sense, what is the most violent thing, this and that, if you're thinking of it in some spiritual sense, they're two very different things, but in the most dramatic sense, um, was probably the first time that I was within earshot of an attempted murder. The bloke didn't die, I won't pretend he did. But um, my very, I was only, so where was I? I was in Parkley Prison. I was 18 or 19, first or second time in. And the cell right next to me, and we share airways. So if you fight in one cell, I'm breathing it in in this cell. That's how it, 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 it close we are. And um, it was like quarter to six in the morning. 
And I think from what I could hear, the two sellies over there didn't know each other. And the one on the top bunk kept jumping down. He mustn't have had cigarettes. And sneaking in mateys like on the bottom bunk, sneaking in his pouch and like stealing a cigarette. Stealing a cigarette. And I just heard the la- I just heard a commotion. But you, you just had your fucking hand in my cigarette, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, long story short, with a little argument, you know, about the cigarettes, he just went in a full stab fest on him. And it's not that the stab fest was um, scary to me. Like when I was 16, 17, whatever, 18, 19, I was known for stabbing people. A lot of the times I was locked up was stabbing people, attempted murder. I feel like it's still shocking. Even even though you were part of it and you do this type of stuff, like it's still shocking to hear it being done and for so little of nothing, like a cigarette, stuff. And stuff like that. But um, it was the reaction and the, the rawness of the bloke who was getting stabbed. And he was like, this was a grown man. The bloke that was getting stabbed may have been about 35, 40 years old. And he was like, crying in a way I never heard someone cry before and asking for help. Crying for his life. In a way that was like directed to the skies. And it was a very like, it made me very like sad and um, scared myself. Like I, I, you know what I mean? Because I was in a cell next to it. So it's almost like I was there. The wing's dead silent. And it's just like a lad, he's just repeatedly stabbing someone. I can hear the stabs. That's not the thing, it was just the, the way the bloke reacted, he was like crying like it was his way out. You know what I mean? Like there was nothing left. And the rawness of his voice and his cry, it were like sent chills, uh, ch- sent chills down my body. Like it was, um, it had me like, had me shook. It had me shook. For- I ain't gonna lie, you heard that boy calling for God. God answered him because he said he was still alive. That's tough. For a few days, I remember that morning just being shook. Like what the, f- it was the first, you know, when you, in the first time in your life, you see the savageness of life. You know, us in, you know, in the Western world and Australia and America and England and that, and we're not used to that shit. You know what I mean? As, as gangster as we are, or as this, we're not used to that just complete savageness. That carnal, that carnival, that carnal nature. I said carnival, carnal nature. You know what I mean? Like people chopped up and shit. Like <clears throat> that was my first experience of, of someone reacting like that. And that, that left me shook. I walked around like a different person for two days. I was like, really like, yeah, it was weird. Like an anxiety is like, bro, that's fucked. Like that, that's fucked. And then I got over it and then got used to it. Yeah, so f- for that reason, that, that was a very dramatic moment in my jail career. You know what's crazy? Like that's what, that's what, prison changed you in that sense. You heard what he said? He said, I went through that, I seen it, I got over it, and it changed me. I was like, damn. And I got used to it, I mean. So it, it inevitably, it changed you. It, it changed how you looked at life and death. It changed, it changed your emotional mindset. Like, it changed you. And I was 18 years old, whatever. And as well, what would you say is the most heinous or the most, the, the, yeah, the most dangerous crime that you were sentenced for as an adult? Most dangerous. <sighs> um, yeah, all right, so, bef- before I had come to terms with um, lowering the violence, there's a little spectrum out in my head, money and violence, brother, you know, they don't work hand in hand, brother, they don't, they don't. go good together. They don't. So when violence used to be here and money used to be there, um, <clears throat> I used to be a bit of a psycho, right? <clears throat> I'm actually a clinically diagnosed, high range psychopath, whatever the fuck they- I, I could like I told y'all earlier, that's very like I told y'all within the first three minutes like bro look crazy, the way he moving is a little bit crazy. Even though he's changed his life, you can see the crazy on him. <laughs> they reckon I don't really care. I got me ten percent off my sentence, so I'm happy. You know what I mean? Are you happy being a psychopath? Yeah, I got ten percent off. That's it. But um, <sighs> I remember one time one of my mates. And I was a bit stupid with the knives and that. So one of my, we in jail. I'm getting out in eight months, eight months to go. My mate's on the phone to a girl, talking to the girl. The girl's boyfriend found out that he's ringing her, whatever. So I'm overhearing, <laughs> he jumps on, he's arguing with my mate, stop bringing my fucking girlfriend, this and that. My mate's, bah, shut the fuck up, I ring who I want, blah, 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 bullshit argument. And I thought, look, I'll jump on and I'll bridge up. So I jumped on, I go, listen, dickhead, fucking what are you gonna do about it? Who are you? You're nobody, I'll get out, I'll fucking smash your head in, I'll kill you. 
That's what I said to him. <clears throat> Silly me, I took it serious. <laughs> Eight months later, <laughs> I full remembered. It's like I wrote it in my diary, cuz. This is, I swear on my fucking children's life, drop dead right now. It's <laughs> Bro was probably on the phone just capping. Capping, acting tough. Hey, hey, quit calling my girl. Who is this, Jody? Jody, that's my girl. Watch when I get out of jail. <laughs> my bad. Y'all ain't never seen Baby Boy when Snoop Dogg was calling Yvette and Jody picked up the phone when he was in jail? My bad. Like, I didn't literally write in my diary, but what I mean is like, it's like I put in my diary, all right, I told this bike I'm gonna kill him, so I'll get out and kill him. Eight months later, I got out. On the day that I got out of jail, I mean that when you get out, you don't even, you, the only thing you get out of, you leave all your property for the boys, but you take your personal letters and photos, right? Makes sense. <sighs> I hadn't even been home to drop off my personal letters or photos yet. So I'm walking back down the hood. My mum lived outside the hood, right? I walk back down the hood. No, I'll go home later. <laughs> go to my mate's house, stash the letters and stuff. I get a change of clothes, put some shoes on because you get out in thongs. And I talk to my mate half an hour, small talk, yeah, bro, what's going on this and that? And I go, hey, bro, where's this <laughs> bro? And I go, knock this <laughs> I've been out for an hour, I promise you. <clears throat> so I went down his house. Um, he wouldn't come out. He wouldn't come out. He didn't have a clue who I was. Mind you, in his head, eight months ago, he's not going to remember arguing on the phone with someone. In my head, it's like, yeah, hey, it's going down, bro. So he's like, who the fuck are you? I'm like, bro, you, I told you, bro, eight months ago, bro, when I get out, I'm going to kill you. He wouldn't come out. I went to the petrol station. I filled petrol up. Don't ask me why. Walking back with petrol, I was going to burn his house down. And my mate's the whole way. My mate that's with me, he's going, dickhead, you're on camera at the petrol station. Don't do it. I'm saying, yeah, he's right. All right, he's right. I wasn't going to do it. Yeah. But when I got there, I still wanted to splash petrol on it for dramatic effect. <laughs> and then um, he come out holding his two kids. Like, like a little bitch, he runs inside his house, gets like a baby and a little five-year-old girl, whatever, and goes, look, bro, I'm here with my kids. And so I was all right, bro. So I said, fucking wait. Honestly, let's talk about it, though. <laughs> let's talk about it. Now, that is, that is a, one of the moves where you like, bro, that's some... But at the same time, you was not letting up. You was not letting up. You were clinically declared insane. The only thing he could appeal to was your compassionate side of you. That's it. Because nothing else, because you were clinically insane, was going to work. Hey, it worked, didn't it? <laughs> Until I say, yeah, bros, I'm going to kill you. Watch this. Went up the street. I still couldn't let it go. Dumb. Like, I'm not saying this is smart crime. I'm saying, I'm telling you this because how stupid I was. Still wouldn't let it go. So I went to the shop. Got a box cutter, right? Two dollar box cutter, and I thought, "Fuck, I'm gonna wait till this comes out of his house, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stab him, right? I'm gonna stab him, right? Not kill him, whatever, bro. Anyway, let's not call. I'm just gonna give him a flesh wound. Let kill because, yeah. Let's just say I'm gonna stab him. <clears throat> so I went up the street. This is the funny part. I went up the street. So I went up the street and waited in the bushes. So I know if he comes out, there's only one way to the shops and to where the boys are selling yandi. He has to come past these bushes. So I sat in these bushes with a box cutter ready to stab this idiot for like three hours. I swear more than two hours, almost three hours. And he rode past on- That's not shocking. On a push bike. I jumped out, pulled him off the push bike, punched him in the face, stabbed him in the neck and hooked her. And um, Wait, you stabbed him in the neck and hooked that? What? What is it? Bike punched him in the face, stabbed him in the neck and hooked her. What does that mean? And um, I end up on the run for it. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, end up on the run. So the dickhead gave me up, told the police and this and that. The, uh, you know what? I'll give him this credit. I'll give the bloke this credit. He tried to lie to the police. He tried to tell the police he fell off his push bike, right? Because he's one of the boys, apparently. So we're not that willing to give each other up to the police, you know? So at least he had an attempt of not being a dog, right? Said I fell off on, on the push bike, they left. Before he got his neck all stitched up, 
they done an x-ray on his neck to clean it out and two, two segments of the box cutter had broken off in his neck. So I, I hit him with force and it snapped two segments and they were still in there. <laughs> but fucking, and it's what got me done. So they pulled box cutter out of his neck and so they rang the police back up and said, mate, this bloke's here, he's got box cutter in his neck. So they come back and they were- Yeah, I don't know if any of y'all know that, but you know, box cutters, they, uh, you can break them off once one, one, when one side gets dull, if you press, pr press them up against something, it breaks off and another piece comes. So that's what he's talking about. Uh, I used to work in a factory is why I know that information. They were hitting him with all these threats, mate. We know you got stabbed. You got half a knife in your neck. And then like a fucking coward, he goes, you Spaniard stabbed me. So anyway, yeah, blah, blah, that's it. So I ended up getting charged for attempted murder for that. Wound with the intent to murder is the exact name of the charge. Um, but I net. fought it in court and I got a hung jury. Jury couldn't decide. Went to the second trial and the, deep, the prosecutor before the second trial offered to lower the charge. So I don't go through a second trial. It's very expensive for the government. You know how it works. And... Um, so they offered me a charge of recklessly wound, which is the lowest possible charge you can get for stabbing someone. So I'm going from the second highest, just under murder, intent to murder, to the lowest. And I'm already on remand for 18 months at this point. So I thought, fuck, you know what I mean? Like I couldn't have that long left. Recklessly wound is not that bad of a, a charge. So mm -hmm. You already on remand, they sending you in there. Wait, what happened? and I got three and a half on the bottom. So I had to do another two years, which is a good result. Because if I, if I committed to the trial and then Lost. unlucky got found guilty, I would have got eight, nine, 10, 11 years. So at that point I'm thinking, but I could get out in 18 months, two years, let's do it. So I put guilty and that was probably, in that sense you're asking the funny violent crimes, that was probably the most dramatic one, yeah. Spanion, how dangerous would you say the streets of Sydney are? in certain areas. Good question, because I'm, I'm curious to know. All right. How dangerous are the streets of Sydney? Sydney, Sydney culture has, has Sydney, Sydney gang culture, Sydney crime culture has changed a lot, right? 20 years ago, early 2000s, late 90s, Sydney was more of a Sydney versus the coppers. Fuck the government. Sydney was more about ripping off banks, flying through the streets in stolen cars, a big fuck you to the police, cop and chasers, this and that. We didn't have, we weren't working in gangs to fight each other. We didn't turn each other. No one gave a fuck about what your postcode was. It don't matter who gives a fuck. No one cared about the number of people in your gang or what your gang's called. That wasn't a thing. It was who you are and how you hold yourself and how much money you make. And you know, that, that was what it's about. That has changed a lot, all right? Sydney culture, Sydney gang culture and crime has changed a lot. And nowadays, it is a lot like that. Uh, it's, it's a lot, it's people in Sydney in gangs fighting each other, people fighting over the fucking name of their fucking suburb and the stupid postcode they have and stuff like that. And so now they're into, now you get around Sydney, you don't see banks getting robbed. You don't see WRXs and Nissan Skyline GDRs flying through the streets with 30 highway patrol behind them. You don't see none of that good crime no more. You see fucked crime. You see people in one suburb killing people in another suburb and people just fighting amongst ourselves now, bro. Unfortunately, I'm sure they all have their reasons why and I'm sure it's really heartfelt, but it, to me, it's disappointing, bro. Like, yeah, it's, it's people are murdering each other. Yeah, that type of crime is very disappointing, man. When you're all about your own people. All the time now. You know, like, in a lot of parts of Sydney, um, drive-bys, it's not such a knife thing. I know you're from England and you love knives. Here it's guns, right? Not gonna pretend that's like Compton or something. Relax, but the guns aren't legal here, but people still have guns, right? So, but there's suburbs out in Western Sydney, there's drive-bys every three days. There's big wars out there, lads are like knocking each, blowing each other's heads off in the streets and the police aren't even reporting it anymore. Like the Man, when I lived in Chicago, I remember I just moved from Chicago 11 months ago. When I first, when I, the last neighborhood I lived in, they were all pretty, you know, crazy. But the last one, I moved in there and they were in the middle of a gang war, didn't even know. 
First day, I tell a story all the time. First day, first day I move in, it's a drive by. I'm dead. Second day, second night, I'm talking like the next week or two at night, shootings every night. I'm like, hey, it's rough. This uh, good night, slept like a baby still. Have his shit going on here, like. Yeah, there's some fucking MS-13 type shootings out here where people are like demolished bodies and that. But um, yeah, I, I, to me it's disappointing. You know, I like that old Sydney. It's like us versus the police. How good do you drive? What bank can you rob? How many stackers can you make? You know what I mean? And so Spanian, I guess when did the life, when did you make that change to become who you are today? <clears throat> How did I become an Australian famous personality. As well, because How everywhere happen, I yeah. went, I was, when I said, who should I interview, your name came up more of than Of course, else's. more than anyone. I'm the personification of Australian culture, Australian street culture. I was there since the beginning. I ain't even gonna lie, I like how you just said that. I am the personification of this. I did this. This me. My fault. Go say it again. I'm the personification. I said, who should I interview, your name came up more of than Of course, else's. more than anyone. I'm the personification of Australian culture, Australian street culture. I was hey, there talk. since the beginning. The boys who are one generation older than me, I call the older boys, were the originators of the way we talk, the way we dress, the way we hold ourselves. So I was a kid witnessing that firsthand. That's been filtered out through the generations now. So a lot of people admire me for what I had witnessed and what I'd done in my life. <clears throat> so during my last sentence, I was over crime, right? For the reason that I'd been a junkie at the bottom that would steal your handbag and steal your laptop out of the car, as small as you can get, to... Okay, I know you're getting real serious right now, but I got a question. If you happen to see, the, see me reacting to this, can you please answer? The tattoo, like, I'm bald-headed. I'm bald. Let's start with that. So, it looked like your baldness is by choice at a glimpse, at the first glimpse. But I don't know how long you had that tattoo across your lining. But my question to you is, is that the tattoo lining but with the dots? I ain't gonna lie, it looked clean. It just looked clean. I couldn't do it because, you know, just for the simple fact, because, you know, of, like it don't look right on me, obviously. My hair don't even grow in that type of, but it's like, I'm just been watching, I'm being curious this whole interview. A good looking muscly drug dealer with chains and cars coming out my ass, right? I've, I've done it. So, and, and the, last, the last sentence was like, just under six years, five years, 10 months, whatever. For that, so I sat in there in my last sentence and I thought, look, I'm not a fucking idiot. I'm not gonna play the same game over and over. Like, I'm 31 years old, 36 now. This is five years ago. I'm 31 years old. I've given away my teenage years. My entire 20s was in prison. I ended up doing 13 years in prison. <clears throat> uh, 13 years all up, boys' homes and prison over the course of 17 years. So I missed everything. Anyone that I could have become, anything that I could have done up until that point was thrown in the bin. And I said to myself like, what do I, what do, I do from here? Do I get out and I be a cool drug dealer again? Like, oh yeah, mad, I'll just do that all again. And it's like, What's there to do? So I thought, fuck it, let's see, I'm going to live my life now. You know what I mean? I had a kid by then who, uh, my son was born while I was in prison. I got out, he was already in primary school, missed all of that. I thought, that's it, bro, you know, I'm moving on. There's more to Anthony, there's more to Spanian than a fuck with, fuck with in prison. So, did I know what I was going to do? No, I didn't. But I knew what I was not going to do. That's how I felt. That's how I felt. At the end of doing whatever I was doing in my past, I was like, yo, I know I don't want to do this no more. You know what I'm saying? Let me focus on something else, man. Because at the end of the day, it's not going to lead you nowhere that you want to be. It's not going to do nothing for you. Yeah, you got this glamorous life for a little bit. Yeah, you got money. You got this. You got that. You know what I'm saying? You got real. I want to say you got no worries, but to the average person looking from the outside in, you got no worries. Uh, but that shit don't be worth it at the end of the day, man. Especially when you get to having kids. Like, the possibility of not being there far outweighs any type of instant gratification. You know what I'm saying? So, uh -uh. 
I'll tell you this one thing. Since 2002, I remember I was 16 in uh, Baxter Juvenile Detention Center. I started rapping. I started rapping, bro. I started writing verses, lad. You know what I mean? And um, I used to admire Bone Thugs and Wu Tang when I was young. And, hey! You know, Bone Thugs, Ohio, Midwest. Bone Thugs. I still love Bone Thugs. I listen to a Bone. It's the Thuggish Fuggish Bone. You feel me? You give me the bit, bit clip, my bad. Right, try to write like fast, like Crazy Bone, my favorite rapper ever, but write with the intelligence of Inspector Deck, top three favorite rappers ever. And back then in Australia, up until very recently, rapping was for fucking idiots. <laughs> rapping is something a fucking idiot does. Jail, boys' homes. If, if you're rapping, if you go to one of the boys and you start saying, yeah, bro, this and that, you know, blah, blah, they're like, bro, shut the fuck up, 50 cent, you're an idiot. Like, mm -hmm. are you a spinner? Are you normal? Do you need medication? Like, rapping ain't cool. So rapping was a secret thing that I'd done from 2002 to 2015, 16, whatever. Um, I, I noticed uh, around 2016, 17, coincidentally, when I got out my last time and didn't want to do crime, I noticed that Aussie hip hop was a thing amongst the younger generations. And I was already- uh, One four. God, stacks of raps like this, but I'm OG at rapping, lad, you know what I mean? So I started putting out raps. I thought I'm not going to do out, not know what I'm doing out here, but I'll get my brother to hold a mobile phone and I'll chuck it into iMovie and I'll chop it up and I'll upload some shit rap to YouTube. And Brian, it worked. <laughs> it worked, brother. And um, I started out rapping, lad, and I learned what Instagram was. I learned fucking what all these stupid things were, you know, that I'm on today. I'm famous on Instagram and TikTok and all these dumb things. And um, I learned about it, made a YouTube channel and started rapping. And I got a big following here. And I think more than my raps, I think what they admired was who I was. They admired who I was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who you are is going to take you very, very far. That's why I be trying to tell people that be starting this stuff. They be like, oh, I want to do this. I want to do that. Man, first of all, who are you? You got to let people know who you really are. Who, who, like, motherfuckers going to stick around. Motherfuckers going to respect you way more once they know who you are. You know what I'm saying? If you instantly get on the internet and start capping, the internet is going to know you're capping, period. They're going to know you to not telling the truth. <laughs> so. Was and the stories that I have. And, and, and you can imagine, I'm sitting here with a bunch of rappers that haven't been seen or heard one tenth of what I have done. So I got out and like, I think they seem like, <clears throat> oh, look at this rapper, he's the real one or however you wanna say it, you know? So I played that part and the very first time I got up, you know, I got a following 40, 50K Instagram followers, whatever. And um, one time someone interviewed me. Someone asked me to do an interview and I didn't know like interviews like interviews. You know, someone wanted to make a doco pretty much similar to what we're doing right now, except they were sitting on the side of a street in my hoodie, Mulla Maloo. You know, it's the first time I ever done one. And I, and when you're in prison, when you're in the streets, you, you come from, you know that old saying, you, I don't know where the fuck everyone gets it from, probably some fucking movie, but it's like, real gangsters don't talk. Real G's move in silence, you know that shit. So I grew up with that shit, that mentality, you know what I mean? Like, I'm real. I'm not saying anything, bro. I can't talk about nothing, bro. That's real gangsters don't talk, real gangsters. Hey, don't let them just lie to you. There's no honor amongst, I do agree with the saying, but like there's, if you really get down to it, there's, there's never been honor amongst thieves. You know what I'm saying? So. It's for Gronks, huh. but I did. You know, and it was a big thing to overcome. And he's sitting there with a the camera and he's saying, so like, what did you do when you were young? Like searching and prison, much like you're asking me. Right On the street level, people might keep it silent. But when you get up in the, in the higher arc, arc, the highest point of criminality, people is flipping, turning states with, they're not getting, no, no, they're not going to jail. Yeah. Right now. And I was there, bro, and I was like, fuck, should I be saying this stuff? And, and I said, bro, and I just telling my own story, not talking about other people's stories. I don't have to. I've done enough myself. You know what I mean? I could go on for days if you want me to, but we only got two hours, brother. But um, <clears throat> telling my story, what I've been through and what I've overcome. And the first time I've done that, bro, the gates opened. And I noticed that all of these, my followers, whatever demographic they're from, 
They don't give a fuck about rap. They want to hear about me and my life and my perspectives. And, you know, they want to know the history of Sydney City and its streets and how we become who we are and what makes the, what makes the lads in Sydney different from the rest of the world and how we prided ourselves. They loved it. So the first time I spoke, boom. You got to find Brody channel, man. Because I'm, I'm actually, I'm not even going to lie to you. I've been kind of interested in Sydney street culture, man, because a lot of people got this to say about it, a lot of people got that to say about it, but why not hear it from the, you know, hear it from somebody that's in it? You know what I'm saying? And me, I'm not here to judge, I'm just here to listen. You know, my whole basis is like comparing what everybody else is going on in the world to Chicago, so. Mm. Gonna be a vibe. Hasn't stopped since, here we are three, three years later, brother. Three years later, brother, that's a huge. Um, Spaniard, could you tell me what's the worst memory of your life, please? <sighs> the worst memory, uh, you know, it's, it's one of these two things. In 2008, I was in prison, of course, uh, on the other side of the state, and my older brother, he was a heroin addict, and um, he overdosed and died. And um, <laughs> I'm pretty sure he overdosed, and died, he overdosed and died in his bed at home. And um, I'm pretty sure it was a suicide, uh, he was a well-versed heroin addict, had been a heroin addict a long time. Heroin addicts know how to not overdose. When heroin addicts overdose, it's usually through reckless behavior, uh, through moods that they're in, you know what I mean? It's, it's actually not that easy to overdose on heroin, despite what you may believe. He overdosed on heroin and I was in prison and they didn't let me go to his funeral. Um, so I dealt with that. My older brother overdosing and dying. My, the only man in my life. My dad was long gone. That's crazy, because you was a little bro. So I know you looked up to your older brother the way my little brother looked up to me. And I know that killed you. I know it. I know it did. All right, pity your bro, man. The only man in my life uh, overdosed and died, bro. And I wasn't there. And every day I dealt with my mum. She could barely talk. She could barely breathe on the jail phone in six minute intervals. I asked if I could go to the funeral and because I had an escape risk on my file over silly shit, um, they didn't let me go. So that was obviously a very hard point in my life. And another thing that always sticks with me is that, so, in 2011, my missus at the time was pregnant. I got locked up. I didn't get out until 2017. My son was born a few months after I went to jail or whatever. I got out, he was like five years old, in school already. So I missed everything. He knew me from jail visits and he loved me and he loves me with all, my, with all his heart, you know what I mean? <clears throat> and um, I got out and I went home. And him and his mum were there, who's my ex-partner now. And um, but this, this shatters me. And I walked in like, you know, I walked, said hello, like, and I walked up into his bedroom. And it's his bedroom, bro, and it's my five-year-old son showing me his bedroom for the first time. And, um. <sighs> hey, it'd be hard. It'd be hard talking about your kids. I'm already knowing. I can't even think of, like, like, I can't even, you know what I'm saying? Like, the thought of me being not in my daughter life make me get like that. So I get it. And he's showing me his toys and shit. And he says to me, he turned to me, and without the context, this doesn't sound sad, but I'll tell you why it's sad. He turned to me in the middle of showing me his cool room, and he said, Dad, I love you. <laughs> Sorry, bro, one sec. He said, Dad, I love you. Can you keep me forever? Like he was a pet. He said that. Damn. It's, like, it's like he's been waiting to say it the whole time, right? Can you keep me forever? And I said, of course I can keep you forever, my boy. And the reason that's so sad to me is that... It sounds deep without context. Like a year after that, me and his mum broke up. <clears throat> we don't get along. And I've never really got along since. 
and uh, you know, like she barely lets me see him. So it was like I lied to him, you know. It's like a letdown. It's like, he's like he said, "Can you keep me forever?" And I and I lied, and here I am, and I was like, I'm barely allowed to. I'm, I can see him. Don't get me wrong, but like. Yeah, a couple of hours here, a couple of hours there, you know? So that's like, you can tell from my reaction to that, that's more sad than even my older brother dying. Um, yeah. But there, yeah, anyway. Uh, they're the two saddest parts of my life, brother. I don't feel sad for myself or any of my life. Or the prison that I've done. 13 years in prison, seen horrific things, done horrific things. I don't feel sad for myself. I feel happy about my life, I don't care. Jail doesn't affect me. After all that jail made me into the man I am. <clears throat> and I'm out here making stuckers off the internet while everyone else who didn't go to jail is digging holes in the street, aren't they? <clears throat> so I can't be too sad, can I? Nah, but, but you're entitled to be sad, my boy. You're entitled to that. You can't be too sad, but you are entitled to be as sad as you want to be. Period. If you had one wish, what would that be? To see your son. If I had one wish, if I had one wish, it's just to have my two sons forever, more kids, and have them more happy, and protect them, teach them to be real men and women if I have daughters, and they're healthy, that's it. There's nothing else, I don't, I don't care, there's nothing else other than that. And before we finish, man, is there anything you'd like to say? And if you're not like to say, um, that's a hard one. Hey, I'm very good at talking when you the director, but when you leave it very open-ended like that, I'm like, ah, there's too many lights, there's too many cameras, bro, I'm lost. Nah, um, no, 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 not much, but that. I, I just, it's just me, Spanian. You wanna know what Sydney City's about? Have a look at me, brother. The personification of it, you know? Yeah, we do say, g'day mate, shrimp in the fucking barbie or whatever the fuck you think we say here. But we also talk like me. And I am Australia, I am Sydney City, lad. We're still one, bruh. We're not to be fucked with. That's one of the coldest endings I ever heard. <laughs> Tell her, leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post. I'm gonna go follow him. I'm going.